Um, I've entitled this message today, Do You Want to Be Well? Can I have that up, Kat? Is that going to come up for me? There we go. Do you, want to, do you want to get well? From John chapter 5, we heard about the paralytic man who had been 38 years beside the pool at Bethesda. Jesus came to that guy and he said, Do you want to be well? So that's, um, that's where we're going to, to focus our attention this morning. And I'm going to struggle with glasses, as you know, because I never know whether to have them on or off. They don't actually make life better. But we'll see how we go. Um, I wanted to start by saying that, that I am the next Jamie Oliver. When we've got a Hello Fresh box and a really good recipe and a video that I can follow step by step and stop and rewind and rewind and rewind and rewind and rewind and rewind a few times. We did for a period of time earlier this year have a Hello Fresh box coming to our house just to try something different, spice up our... And I said to Tony, look, I'll, I'll, I'll give it a go, I'll cook. And I was excellent. <laughs> I was really good. When I had the Hello Fresh box and all the instructions and the recipes and the videos, I was really good. And that we had some really lovely meals. But what would happen is Tanya, who has for most of our married life had the kitchen as her domain, would pop in and say, Can I help? And I'd be like, No! <laughs> I've got this. I can do this. I'm fine. I don't need your help. And it was true, I didn't need a help, I was fine. It all went well, it was fine. But, but what I want to point out this morning is that in that particular instance, I had this fierce independence that I could do it and I didn't need any help. You know, it, it actually starts right back at childhood when we read books that teach us fierce independence. I can do it myself. I don't need any help. Kids putting on their shoes and socks. Kids getting their own breakfast, feeding themselves without any help. You know, it all starts there. But unfortunately, what actually happens is that continues and continues and continues to where we become adults who think that we're fiercely independent and don't need any help. Is there an area of your life where you're fiercely independent and don't need help? I know when Tony and I first got married, we had in our mind we needed to be able to do this without the help of mum and dad. Now, Tanya's parents were uh, kind of very actively involved in our lives frequently. (laughs) 
<laughs> if you're listening, Gary, I'm sorry, but it's true. Beautiful people who were frequently active in our lives. And we were like, we don't need their help. Why do they have to keep helping us? We don't need their help. We can do it. We're, we want to be able to do it. We didn't want to have to borrow money off them. We didn't want to have to ask them for help. We wanted to just do it ourselves. We were fiercely independent. And you know, years of humanism in schools and media have convinced our society that with enough self-will, with the right education and enough self-discipline, we can solve anything. We can do anything. What we're actually doing is we're eating from the, knowledge, the tree of knowledge of good and evil again as we do that. We can do it. We don't need any help. We want to be our own God. We don't need any help. Life without God. That describes most of the people who live in our community today. But even as Christians, and I've said this to you before, we can live kind of like functional atheists. That is, we believe in God for our salvation, but the rest we do ourselves. And we can be our own biggest problem. The problem that we have is flesh. The scripture says that the flesh is at war with God. Humanism is at war with God. I can do it myself is at war with God. Fierce independence, especially in relation to God, is in essence at war with God. Now Jesus taught in Mark 2.17 that he didn't come to those who were well. He said, I haven't come for the self-righteous or the righteous. They don't need a doctor. I have come for those who are sick, who recognize their need for sinners. He says, I did not call to come the righteous. To, I did not come to call, I'm reversing my words. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 9. And so as we approach this passage this morning, it was a long passage from John chapter 5. I'm just going to pull out a few truths that I think point this out. We all need Jesus today. Not just the day we were saved not just when he comes in all his glory with the angels and saints with him, but today. We all need Jesus today to save us in, not from, in our circumstance, in our sin and our self. I think that our passage shows that quite clearly today. I want to just summarize the passage for you. Um, in, in a short, succinct kind of version rather than the extended reading that we had. Jesus says on, the, on, on the, the feast day, which we assume is the Passover, Jesus shows up at this place, Bethesda, where there's this pool. And there's all these, it, call, it calls them uh, uh, paralyzed, blind, lame. Actually, the word the scripture uses is impotent, without strength without power people who were laying beside this pool. And the mystic story goes, you'll notice in your Bible you, we have verse 1 to 3, and then most Bibles today go straight to verse 5 because the earliest manuscripts don't include verse 4. Verse 4 was probably added by a scribe after the fact to explain why these people were all hanging out by this pool. And the scribe who added the mystic story afterwards said, it was said that an angel would come and stir the pool, and the first in would be healed. So they were all hanging out by this pool, waiting for their moment when the water stirred, and they could go in the pool to be healed. And Jesus sees this guy who's been by this pool for 38 years. And he walks up to him and says, do you want to be well? 
And the man says, sir, I, I do. I do want to be well. He says, but I, I've been here for a long time. And the problem is, every time the water stirs, someone else gets in before me because I don't have someone to carry me and take me and put me in the pool. I have no help. I'm stuck. And Jesus says, be healed. Take up your, take up your mat and go home. So he was instantly healed. He did exactly what Jesus said. He took up his mat. Off he went. And we all know what happens next. The Pharisees, who always give us a good example of a, what not to do, grabbed this man and said, what are you doing on the Sabbath carrying your mat? And so, well, the man who just healed me, catch those words, the man who just healed me from 38 years beside the, the, the pool waiting to be healed, the man who just healed me told me to get up and take it with me and go. And they said, who was it? And he said, I don't know. He didn't tell me his name. And they, 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 were, they wanted to chase down who, who it was. Later on, it tells us that um, Jesus found the guy later on in the day and, and said to him, he said, you know, you've been healed. You are now well. Go and sin no more so that something worse doesn't happen to you. And the man goes back to Jesus and says, oh, I know who it was now. It was Jesus. He, chat, he had a chat to me. It was Jesus. And it says that they wanted to kill him because he healed the guy and told him to carry his mat on the Sabbath. And then Jesus responds to their challenge about healing on the Sabbath with this very majestic passage that describes Jesus' relationship to the Father, that he wants to only do the things that the Father tells him to do, and that his Father's always working and he's working, that he and the Father are one, that Jesus was saying, I am God in human form here among you, and they wanted to stone him all the more. Jesus explains to them, well, you're judging this guy about his mat, but actually, he that believeth in me is going to go in, uh, pass from death into life, and those who face judgment are going to go to destruction. But you aren't listening. You don't want to hear what I've got to say. You don't, you don't even take what you believe seriously. Moses testifies, and you don't listen to Moses. You don't even live up to your own standards, Jesus says to them. You're going to be sunk, not on my judgment, but on your own. That's the short summarized version of what we see, and we're going to go into a little bit of detail from a few of those things in this passage this morning. But the very first thing I want us, I want us to just take the three characters that we see in this passage. We see Jesus... We see the paralytic and we see the Pharisee. So let's just quickly um, start with Jesus. There's a few key things I think we really need to understand that happens here. Jesus shows up to this multitude and sees this one guy and Jesus sought him out. Out of all the people there, Jesus went and spoke to this guy. We don't see evidence. Sorry, I thought that was tipping over. I must have just been having a moment. We don't see any evidence that, that Jesus went and saw everybody else. He just spoke to this guy, one among many. The man never knew who Jesus was, verse 13 says. When they asked, who was he? He said, I don't know. Didn't even tell me. So this man had a supernatural encounter he couldn't explain because Jesus showed up and did it to him. The man had a very limited role in the whole thing. Now you might think as I say that that I'm preaching in the sovereignty of God, that God will save who he wills. Well, I am. Because that's what the Bible says. God will save who he wills. He says in Romans 9, verse 20 and 21, that he sa what is it to God? What, who, who do you think you are to question God, when he takes two pieces of pottery and elevates one to a place of uh, privilege and use and specialness, and when he destroys another by throwing it on the heap, God does save who he wills. Jesus sought this one man out of the multitude. But I would like to point out even though there was just this one guy at that particular moment that Jesus reached, he actually saved a multitude through this story. Right? 
It's not like God just chose that person and no one else. In fact, he, Jesus uses this paralytic as a perfect opportunity to have another attempt at reaching the Pharisees. His mind, it appeared, was closed toward him. But this whole issue with this paralytic man, Jesus uses to say, oh, well, while we're talking about it, seeing as you've raised the issue of carrying mats, let's have a conversation. So I believe the Scripture does teach the sovereignty of God, that is, God chooses. It says that he chose us from the foundations of the world. So I do believe in the sovereignty of God. And all you Calvinists are there going, great, we're going to get a great Calvinistic sermon here. But there's more to the story, Colin. I'll get to it. <laughs> Jesus sought this one out of the multitude, but there are many who were reached by his actions. And you know who else have been reached by Jesus' sovereignly touching that guy's life? What are we doing? We're hearing that story, right? We're seeing God's sovereign act in reaching that one guy. And God is sovereignly acting in reaching all of us today. He did not just reach that one guy. And we don't know in what other manner the witness of that man went on. It's the last we hear of him in the scriptures. But we do know that Jesus sought him. Jesus seeks and saves that which is lost. In Luke 15, we three, see three parables where this is so clearly taught. The parable of the lost sheep, where he leaves the 99 to go after the one who's out wandering alone, and he brings him back. Where he, has, he tells the parable of the coins, where, where one coin is lost, and, and the, the, the woman looks and looks and looks until she finds the precious coin, where he tells the story of the prodigal son who was uh, the son who'd wandered away, and the whole time the father's heart is for the son, praying that he will come back, reaching out towards him the moment he returns. Jesus seeks you and I. We think that it's our act. Those who believe in the ultimate depravity of man, another good Calvinist teaching, would say that we actually can't lift a finger to help ourselves unless God reaches down to us. You know what? That's absolutely true. It is. It's, it's true. We can't lift a finger to ourselves. Jesus seeks you and I. None can come to the Father unless the Father call him. And yet he says, whosoever will may come. So I think this passage teaches us very clearly that Jesus seeks us. But Jesus also responds to the Pharisees. So he's not just dealing with this one guy. He's not just sovereignly touching the life of this one man. He's actually touching the lives of this group, this group of Pharisees who were fiercely independent through their self-effort. Let me read to you verse 38 and verse 40 from a passage. Verse 38 says, "You don't." Jesus speaking to the Pharisees says, you don't have his word residing in you because you don't believe the one he sent. And verse 40, Jesus says to them, but you are not willing to come to me so that you may have life. What is the purpose of Jesus saying those things to them? Why is Jesus saying to them, you're not willing to come to me? Why is Jesus saying to them, you don't believe in the one that he sent, if not to call to repentance of those people who want to kill him? So Jesus isn't just sovereignly touching the life of this one guy who gets healed, this paralytic man. No, he's actually using this to reach you and I today, along with the Pharisees. See, these Pharisees, they thought they had no need of God as they served God through their acts of the flesh. They kept eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. This is good, that is bad. This is good, that is bad. This is good, this is good, that is bad, that is bad. You carrying your mat, you are bad. That's what the Pharisees were doing. Jesus was seeking even those who wanted to kill him. And Jesus is seeking today. Revelation 3.20 says, I stand at the door and knock. 
If anyone will open, I will come in and I will dine with him and he with me. He's knocking. He's asking the question of you and I today and the paralytic man and the Pharisees. Do you want to be well? So I think we've come, we have to come to this conclusion that we all need Jesus today to save us in our circumstance, in our sin, and in our self-life. We don't just need him as a one-time fix. We need him in every moment of every day. Let's talk about the paralytic man for a moment that we read of. Oh, don't think it's supposed to look like that. Uh, I'll go back to the picture of the paralytic. Where's that? Oh, that one will do. So the paralytic man, the scripture says he was um, 38 years, and the King James Version uses the word impotent. 38 years, we use the word paralyzed or immobilized or unable. But the scripture uses the word impotent. And, and, and impotent, obviously, we have modern connotations of that word, but it's, it's, it's best described as without strength. He had no strength. His legs had no strength to lift him. His body had no strength to hold him upright and live in the everyday world. And he had been 38 years without strength, completely reliant on someone. And yet that someone turned out to be no one because he was still stuck. The someone that he needed hadn't showed up. 38 years without strength. Made me think as I read that, that 38 years without strength of Romans 5. Verse 6 says, and in the King James again, it uses that exact translation for while we were without strength at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For rarely will someone die for a just person. But for a good person, perhaps someone might even dare to die. But God proves his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were like this guy, without strength, without anyone to help, stuck in our own predicament. It's exactly the kind of person Jesus was seeking. Those who knew their need. Yet Jesus asked this guy, he said, do you want to be well? Well, that's a bit of a dumb question, don't you think? After 38 years of being without strength, stuck, lying beside a pool, do you honestly think that he didn't want to be well? And yet Jesus asks him, and here's the reason I think, because many of us prefer our fierce independence. We don't want anyone to help us. I can do it myself. This paralyzed man had stayed as he was for 38 years. Really? Really? There was no one in 38 years to help the guy? He couldn't have organized a friend of a friend of a family friend's former roommate's sister? Like there wasn't anyone to come and help the guy? He was here for healing, right? As I said before, verse 4, omitted in many Bibles, probably added by a scribe, explains this myth that an angel would stir the water and the first in would be healed. In 38 years, no opportunity? <coughs> Pardon me. Sorry about that. Perhaps his stated goal was a kind of excuse to stay as he was. I mean, lying by the pool, no responsibilities... Didn't have to hold down a job. He wasn't cooking or cleaning or looking after a household or family. No one else to care for. Just him and his mates sitting by the pool. It wasn't a resort though. Perhaps he preferred to stay as he is. Perhaps you and I can prefer to stay as we are as well. In our fierce independence. Because there's comfort, isn't there, in predictability? You know, you've got into a routine. You know what you do and when you do it. 
You're not looking for someone to come and shake up your life. I know a lot of my atheist friends would say, if there is a God, well, I'll talk to him about it when I get there. He can, he'll, he'll, he'll respond to me on my terms. I'll tell him what's what. Perhaps we today have accepted Jesus as saviour. Maybe we prayed a prayer, got a ticket to heaven, but we deny his involvement in our daily lives. We live like we don't really have a God. We might give him a few moments through the week. We don't really need him to get through the day today. Jesus demonstrates with this paralysed man that he asked him, do you know where you are? Do you know what's going on with you? You're sick, right? Do you want to be well? You know, we need to accept and acknowledge where we are before we can leave where we are. Then we're ready to accept Jesus' help in our circumstance. Jesus teaches where to abide in him moment by moment in living active need like a vine and a branch. The branch can't bear any fruit if it's not connected to the vine. And so Jesus asks this guy, and he asks us in the midst of our circumstances today, he says, do you want to be well? And he's asking us today, do you want to be well? Where are you at? Are you willing to accept where you're at so that he can lift you from the miry clay? And put your feet upon a rock. We all need Jesus' help today to save us in our circumstance, sin and self. Now before you all answer, do you want to be well, give a few moments thought to the third response, which was that of the Pharisees. Now, an umpire, a referee, he's not exactly a Pharisee, but they are quick to call the shots as they see them, right? Jesus used this man, this paralytic, this man who had no strength, to show the Pharisees their deepest need. You see, we're all going to face judgment. But we're not going to be judged in the way that we think. Jesus told this man to take up his mat and go. So what we've had is a great miracle, right? Yes, right? Great. Let's say someone had been wheeled into our congregation every week for 38 years. And you'd help them when they need to go to the bathroom. You'd help them when they needed to get out over the rocky ground towards their car. You'd wheeled them in and help them sit here in the congregation. And let's say that Jesus healed them. That would be a great miracle, right? Yes, it would be a great miracle. I think that we kind of think just because this is biblical days, oh yeah, well, you know. No, this was a great miracle. 38 years lying on a mat, now walking. And what do the Pharisees do? You can't do that. Are you serious? They chastise the man for not walking in their holiness, their version, their description of what it is to be holy on the Sabbath. And they completely ignore this amazing miracle that's taken place. This guy who's been on a mat for 38 years, now walking among us. You'd think the rest of us would be celebrating, right? See, these Pharisees in their fiercely independent, we can do it ourselves attitude, which they judged everyone else by, were judging this man, after having a real encounter with God, in some small detail that they thought he fell short. Now, he didn't have many good theological words or arguments to defend himself. Verse 11 says, The guy who healed me told me to. You'd think that'd be enough, though, right? 38 years on a mat now, up and walking. God's at work. You'd think the Pharisees who are on about God at work would say, God's at work. But they don't. In their fierce independence, we know we can do it ourselves. What do they do? They point out what was wrong with the guy, like moments later. He said, the man who made me well told me to. They had so systematized their relationship to God that there was actually no room for God to actually show up in their daily life. Where is the man, they say. 
Now, not only were they going after the guy carrying the mat, they were after the perpetrator of this dastardly act. Show me the man who healed you. What? How dare he? You've got to be kidding me. I've been on a mat 38 years. Where is he? They're after him for breaking the Sabbath because the Pharisees in their keeping of the Sabbath had made it their golden calf. The Sabbath was their sacred cow. It was the law above all laws. In fact, after the destruction of the temple in 70, the Sabbath was actually now elevated to being the queen of God. The Sabbath was their sacred cow and this man was breaking their rule. They revered the Sabbath as a weekly collection of rituals that determined we can do it. We know what to do. We can please God. And that's bad enough. But not only did they do that, they then judged everybody else by their standard. So what do they decide to do? Well, this is the first thing I'd do, of course, when someone healed someone I loved. Let's go and kill him. Are we catching the irony in this story? An amazing miracle of God, and we're going to go and kill him. They decide to plot to kill Jesus, this one who did the amazing miracle. And I think, actually, as Jesus saw straight through that stuff, and he looked at them and he says, Ah, oh, I think you're going to kill me, do you? Yeah, I've got news for you, fellas. You don't believe in me? You're going to face the judgment. You think you can judge. Ha <laughs> ha! You think you're judging. Actually, I'm going to be the judge. My father has given me the responsibility, the right to judge the living and the dead. I'm the judge. And I'm going to judge by this. He that hears my words and believes my father sent me, he's going to have eternal life. And if you think that you're going to get there on your deeds, there will be a judgment according to deeds. And he says the good be raised to life. And the evil be raised to condemnation. But we know that Jesus said elsewhere that there's none good, not one, only God. That if you've broken one of the laws, you've broken all of the laws. And in fact, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. None of those Pharisees were going to make it if they wanted to be judged by their deeds. It was not they, but he who is the judge of everything, and he's going to raise the dead and judge those who don't believe in him. And so Jesus asks us this question today. He says, do you want to be well? I've missed a couple there. Do you want to be well? Do you want to be relieved from your religious rule-keeping and judgment towards others? which is really a curse by which you judge yourselves. In verse 45 to 47, he speaks of this. He says, he says in verse 45, Do you think that I will accuse you to the Father? No, your accuser is Moses, on whom you've set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, because he wrote about me. But if you don't believe what he wrote, how will you believe my words? Now I want to make this really real for us here just for a moment. I think there's a challenge as we see these Pharisees responding to a man who was healed and picked up his mat. They, in their religious rule-keeping, in their well-meaning, I, I don't think the Pharisees weren't well-meaning, I think that they honestly believed that they were trying to do that which God had ordained, that they, they recognised that it was all about God and serving God, and yet they failed to see the speck in their, the, the log in their own eyes, they pointed out the speck in this fellow. They didn't even live up to the law of Moses. They were going to be condemned not by Jesus, but by their own law that they couldn't keep. I want to make it real for us. Because I think we see not the same thing, but a similar thing that can happen in churches. We have a number of ministries now that bring people who are like this paralytic. You know, people who are without strength. People who don't have God in their world. 
people who need to be drawn to the Saviour, who Jesus is seeking. Through the Restore ministry, we know about that vibrant and important ministry of our church where we are intentionally going after people who are ex-offenders from prison, people who've been spat out by that system, people whose lives are not uh, um, characterised by the kind of life that you might think you live, people who've done a very different and tough kind of life compared to, to others. Do they know what we'd expect of them if they walk through this door? What should we expect of them the moment they walk through this door? Chappie Nick's youth ministry we've heard of this morning, we've spoken of, is, is bringing young people from outside the church whose experience with God has been as a swear word, or a curse word, or some media lampooned idea of God as a violent judge or an evil dictator or worse. They're going to come to our very door. They already are. We're seeing some of those people that Chappie Nick's working with straight from the school in our youth group on a Friday night. Do they know what we'd expect or what we should expect if they were to come through our door. You know, we have the brigades ministry, the community choir, praise dance. We've got lots of things that are reaching out to bring people who may only act on the little they already know. That guy's best theological answer was, the paralytic, on the guy who healed me, told me to. How will we respond to people who come and don't necessarily meet all of our very polished and ritualised, clean behaviours. Now, I assume that nothing like what the Pharisees did would ever happen here. But as I was discussing this with some people this week, I found out I was wrong. So I want to challenge us with this thought. I know our intentions are good for the glory of God, for the holiness of the church, for the good in the world rather than more evil in the world. I I, I completely am for all of those things. But I want to just challenge us. Some of us need to be reminded that people who walk in here may have no idea about the way we do things, what we say and don't say, what we wear and don't wear, And I just want to be be honest with you and say, as I've discussed with a few people this week, I've heard people have been told, don't wear your hat in here. Turn your hat around. Why are you wearing your hat in church anyway? People have been told, that shirt's not appropriate for church. Why are you wearing that? People have been told about aspects of their behaviour that aren't becoming to a Christian. Fair enough. Of course. But are we missing the great miracle that Jesus has sought and brought that person to us today and getting caught up in our own thing that we think we need to add? There is a danger. And I want to challenge us soberly but honestly and thank you for the fact that we really are a loving, authentic community. And I know that every single one of your heart is for every person who comes in this door. Maybe it's because of the way we were brought up or what was done to us. Well, that's how we learned. Did you really? Did someone saying to you, don't wear your cap in church, really transform your life? Did someone say you don't wear that shirt or that shirt's too revealing or whatever? Did that really transform your life? Or are we just being like those Pharisees who the first thing that they saw was the the guy carrying the mat? See, Jesus didn't actually just tell him to carry his mat. It's really important that we see this as true. 
There's a powerful truth that we see in our passage today. When Jesus works in an order, Jesus does his work and we don't have to do it for him. So what does he do? He heals the guy and then he disappears for a while. Let's all this rubbish with the mat happen because he wants to deal with those Pharisees. But then he finds the guy later in the day and he says, now, um, there's another thing I want to talk to you about. He says, um, I don't want you to continue on in sin because something worse might happen. So he deals with his sin. Jesus does. I'm not saying we don't deal with it. I'm saying let's not be judgmental finger pointers at people who walk through our door who don't know our way of doing things on the first time they ever show up. This has happened to my children. It's probably happened to your children. It's probably happened to you. It might have happened 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago. Someone might have done it. But that doesn't mean it's right. See, we want to lovingly disciple one another. We do speak the truth in love. We really should. But speaking truth in love is not walking up to some random person you don't know, you've never seen before, you have no relationship with, and telling them the shirt puts, is, is wrong. You know what I mean? Like, Is there a time to do that? Absolutely. Is it the first time you see some person? No, it's not. We don't know their story. We don't know what God's doing in their heart and in their life. And I just want to challenge us with that because we are walking into a season where God is bringing people to us from the surrounding community that he's called us to love. And the thing, I'm not saying we don't ever do those things. I'm saying don't miss the miracle that Jesus has sought and brought them for some little dot point that doesn't, it's not, doesn't compare to the miracle of Jesus seeking and bringing them. We'll deal with those things in due course. It's actually God who transforms us, not someone telling us that we're wearing the wrong thing or doing the wrong thing or smoking the wrong thing or whatever. The truth is we are going to come across people who are going to do exactly things that we don't like, exactly things that don't reflect what we've come to understand over 40, 50, 60 years of living as a Christian is the Christian life. Well, of course they don't know. They're just starting. Well, they haven't even started yet. They were scared to walk in the building. And one young fellow who will not bring his girlfriend because he says, I'm worried that she'll get judged because she doesn't wear the same kind of clothes as everybody else. I hope you're hearing the love in my heart as I say this. I'm not, I'm not against you. I love you. I thank you. You guys are loving. You may not have just seen this possibility that sometimes happens. It definitely happened in our passage. The Pharisees missed the miracle and went to rule pointing. And they missed the whole point. Jesus works in an order and it probably isn't ours. Think about your own salvation experience for a minute. What was the first thing that changed? The second, the third, the fifth, the tenth, the twentieth, the hundredth. If we checked the order of those things in each of our lives, they would not be the same. There are as many discipleship journeys as there are unique people that Jesus calls. And it's his work to transform us and and change us from the inside out. Guess what? If you change yourself, who did it? So my suggestion as a final thought on this passage is that this we often... It's the surface level judgment about little nothings. We miss the big miracle that Jesus is seeking the lost and saving them. And I'm, I'm concerned for this next phase of ministry where we reach people in the, in the manner that we have been. That we don't cut off the work that God's doing over some little insubstantial thing. They're without strength. They're impotent. They're the exact people that Jesus calls us to reach. And so Jesus is calling all of us today, do you want to be well? And I I think there are a few responses that we can go down the path of today as we respond to this truth. 
Jesus used this encounter with the paralytic and the Pharisees to teach us today, from verse 24, who, whoever hears this word of mine and believes in him who has sent me has eternal life and will not come under judgment but has passed from death to life. See, Jesus will be the judge. And what he is going to judge by is belief and unbelief. He that believeth in me will have everlasting life. The Pharisees want to take their chances with the deeds of map carrying. You wonder how high that ranks on God's scale of things. Map carrying on the Sabbath. Which will actually end in condemnation, verse 29 tells us. The paralytic saw his need and he was met with life. How will we respond today? Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have it to the full. And what he means is, I have come that you might have me, Jesus, living in you, a new and living way. And he says to all of us, do you want to be well? So as we respond to this this morning, let's just, everyone bow your heads, close your eyes just for a moment. I don't often do this, but I really felt the need to as I was praying through this passage this week. I want to give an opportunity for, for, for a true and genuine physical response today to what, what this passage teaches about the work of the Spirit of God. So we see in this passage physical healing like the paralytic Jesus said to him, do you want to be well? How many of us are dealing with illness today? Do you want to be well? I think we can pray for healing. And we can trust the God of the universe to do what's right. And if God has led you and said that he will heal you to you, I think you can pray for that in faith. The scripture says that the prayer of the righteous man will make the sick person well. We're called to do it. So in a few minutes' time when I make this call, I'd like those of you who want to be prayed for for healing to come forward and we'll pray for you. I can't guarantee the response, but Jesus can. He'll do what he's promised to do for you. Do you want to be well? We've also seen that salvation is a key part of this passage. If you believe in him, Hear these words and believe in him who sent me. You will have everlasting life. If you've not heard the words of God before and believed in him who sent, you can have that today. Jesus calls you to salvation, to pass from condemnation to life. If you'd like for us to pray with you unto salvation, we'd like to do that this morning. Perhaps you've stalled in your Christian walk, you're kind of like lying by the pool, waiting for something to happen. You're saved, but you're living like everything depends on you. You're not really depending on Jesus in your daily life. We'd like to pray with you, and we'd like to encourage you in your growth. We'd like you to come forward, that we can pray with you too. Maybe that last thing that I was talking about, that finger pointing about things that happens from time to time, that that we understand the reason why it happens, but I think you can see it's not what we need to be doing. Maybe you need to repent of that, bring it before Jesus and move from judgment to life-giving friendship and counsel. Perhaps you'd like to come forward and we can pray with you for that. So they're the four things I'm encouraging you to think about this morning. Do you want physical healing? Do you want salvation? Do you want to move forward in your growth? Do you want to repent of having a judgmental attitude or finger pointing at others? If you want to respond to any of those things, then I encourage you to come and sit. We've got uh, rows at the front over here, rows in the centre where you can come and sit. And uh, I'll get a few of the elders and myself and Pastor Steve to pray with you. Let's just have a moment of silence. Let me pray for you. Lord, I thank you for your word that is living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword, dividing between joints and marrow, soul and spirit, that is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Everything is uncovered. 
and laid bare before the eyes of you who, to whom we give an account. As we sit here in your presence right now, Lord, I pray for your spirit to move. Move on our hearts. Move us another step. May we be like the man who says, yes, I want to be well. Lord, make us well today as we respond to you in truth in Jesus' name. And just in the silence, if you want to move and come and sit in one of these seats so that we can pray with you, I'd ask you to do that now. I'd ask the music team to come and join us up on the stage as well. Just come, sit in one of those front seats. We'd like to pray with you. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit 
would rest and remain on each one of us. Carry what we've heard and what you've been doing by your spirit in our hearts today into this day, into this week, into the rest of our lives, that we'll be transformed by the presence of Christ. When you say, do you want to be well? We say, yes and amen, Lord. I want to be well. Amen. Thanks for coming and joining with us. We're not finished praying. If you want to come forward for prayer, feel free to do that.